My name is Bob Manning. I'm a member of the board of directors of the Villanova University Alumni Association, and I'm director of wealth management in Philadelphia with Morgan Stanley Smith Barney. Uh, welcome to this breakout session entitled Ethics, Responsibility, and Governance. Where is the balance? I am, I am honored to introduce our panel. Our panel moderator is Dr. Jonathan Doe, Professor of Management and Operations, Herbert G. Ramrath, Endowed Chair in International Business, Director of the Center for Global Leadership in the Villanova School of Business. And he will introduce our panelists. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. Thanks very much. Welcome, everyone. We're uh, running a little bit behind schedule, but maybe we can uh, make up a, a bit of time here. Uh, we're delighted to have you with us. If you notice, our uh, table is kind of over here to the to my left. And so those of you over there, if you want to nudge over at some point so you're more in our line of fire or us in yours, feel free to. Uh, I'm really delighted to moderate this uh, panel on a very important topic. This was something that has already been discussed in the uh, summit so far. Um, uh, our plenary speaker and the panel certainly touched on some of the issues we're going to get into here. And I'm also delighted to have these three uh, wonderful panelists. To my far right is Ron Cruz. Ron is a Villanova uh, alum. He uh, oversees a uh, uh, global logistics business, and he's written a very interesting book about international business that deals with some of the ethical challenges in international business. And I'm pleased to say he's also joined the advisory council of the Center for Global Leadership. And I did leave a little uh, propaganda, promotional material, I should say, with you about the Center for Global Leadership. And I'm happy to talk with you any more about it if you're interested in learning more. Uh, in the middle here is Denise Devine, another alum. Um, went on to do a graduate degree elsewhere. We don't hold that against her. Uh, Denise has also had a very interesting uh, business and professional career, a political and, and government career as well. She's been a real supporter of our efforts here to infuse the curriculum with more ethics and social responsibility. Uh, and then to my immediate right is Frank Sweeney, president of uh, TDK. I, I hadn't, didn't know Frank before today, but we've exchanged some emails, and I know that he has some interesting insights and perspectives on this uh, topic as well. Their complete bios of, are, of course, in the program. Um, I'm not going to uh, go on uh, here any further, uh, but let me just tell you what the ground rules that we've agreed on, or maybe I've imposed. Um, uh, they are that each of our panelists will speak for about five minutes, just giving kind of a broad brush perspective on some of the issues that they think are salient and important with regard to ethics, governance, um, both from a legal and political you know, point of view, but also from a corporate responsibility perspective. I may then follow up with a question or two for them and then we'll open it up to you. We only have 45 minutes and we may not even have that, um, so we want to kind of keep things moving along. So without further ado, let me ask uh, Ron Cruz to offer a couple of his uh, perspectives and we'll take it from there. Thanks again, Ron. Okay. Well, thank you, Jonathan. W what a question, right? Well, what I did first um, uh, I would like to kind of start with the definitions. So, governance. Anybody here care to take a shot at what they think governance, governance is, consists of? Anybody? Okay. <laughs> well, it's, a, it, it's, it's a process of decision making and the process by which decisions are implemented. Okay, everybody? Good enough? All right, what about ethics? Come on, somebody in here has got something on ethics. This is the easiest Do the right thing. Do the right thing. All right, system of more principles. Very good, very good. I like you. You're going to get called on a lot. <laughs> First time I've ever been in front of Usually in the back, chewing gum. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Looking for the door. There's no door in the back, though. Responsibility. Anybody want to take a, take a shot? Okay, well, accountability to those that will be affected by decisions or actions, okay? So for the heck of it, and I'm trying to get my, my head around this, so I, I decided I'd Google governance ethics, okay? Just to see kind of what came back. Well, on the first page, and everybody knows how the organic search goes, so either this is who everybody's listening to or nobody's Googling it, one or the other. Is... Uh, a series of articles, one by the Olympic Committee. I found that pretty fascinating. I mean, I think we all know basically, and even better than that, it was on transparency. I thought that was pretty good. <laughs> well, it just, it was, anyway. So then I see uh, an article there by the World Bank on ethics. 
Now, to me, I just took that as a total joke. I've done business with the World Bank, and, and, and this is not one of your ethically bound organizations. I don't mean to offend anybody, but it's just not. Um, and then, okay, so this is all first page stuff. So I'm starting to think this has got to be what people are not Googling. So I see a site called ethicsrussia.org. Now, now there's interesting. This is a group called CBE, the Center for Business Ethics, and it is their resolute job to try to create ethics and business in Russia. And I kind of thought, now you know what, now there is a, talk about the, the unclimbable hill, the insurmountable obstacle. These guys have got their work cut out for them. Okay, but nonetheless, you know, and, and kind of going off what uh, the keynote speaker said, uh, there's a hill to climb, and these guys are certainly climbing it every day. So anyway, I wasn't finding anything there, so I looked to balance, okay? So the key part of what makes this question tough, I think, is how do you find balance? Uh, the other things unto themselves uh, are easy to find, pretty easy to comprehend, and then the thing about balance. Well, as I looked into it, it, very much the problem with balance is it's an eye of the beholder issue. Uh, the issues, and, and there's so many different issues, social, political, you, you name it. And with this eye of the beholder uh, issue, you, for instance, if you were to ask, uh, say, you know, what is the level of uh, uh, corporate ethics? If you ask somebody from Greenpeace, say, they're going to say, well, there's almost nil. On the other hand, if you turn and you ask Bernie Madoff, he's probably going to say, you know, I find most corporations to be pretty ethical. So you've got an eye of the beholder issue here. And to give you an, an idea of what would happen, I mean, for instance, if, if we were to bring up, and just in this small group and in this uh, uh, in forum, if we were just to bring up abortion, uh, that, that very socially, politically charged subject, we, we could probably get a real ruckus going in about five minutes in here. So you've got everybody coming from different groups. So how do you find balance, OK? The other thing I found is perception is reality. PR is a big part of what, unfortunately, what people call ethics and finding balance, okay? Those that have done little have been very praised if you look through the media, if you actually search this out. And on the other hand, those that have been vilified in the past, actually now today are some of the, the front runners in their industries and on their socially or, or political issues. So you've got balance. Balance is contextual, it's complex, it's relative. Okay, so what does that tell me? It tells me that the answer can't be made from 60,000 feet, which tells me that the government has really got no, I mean, we've heard everybody mention Sarbanes-Oxley, and I mean, everybody will again, but everybody in Washington and the government knows probably, here we go again, there's going to be something like this that's going to follow. Will it work? No. And, and unfortunately, what will happen is, is that, that will happen for sure will be the law of unintended consequences. This, this will be certainly what comes out of any legislation of ethics that follows the, the, the whole Wall Street, uh, AIG debacle, et cetera, okay? So uh, this is a trench battle, and this is where I'm getting, and, and what I'm kind of putting forward to you guys is this is a trench battle, which means it's an individual battle. You can't, you can't theorize from up here because it's too complex, so every individual has to be approached. So you've got to approach it on an individual level. Who is the best fit to do that? Well, three questions, I guess, then. So what, if you're going to approach it on an individual level? Who and how? And I'll, I'll throw out a couple of things on the uh, what and the who. Uh, in his own inevitable way, Mark Twain, uh, in a mutually exclusive way, said once about being successful, he said, if you can learn to fake honesty and integrity, you really got it made. Well, his point being, of course, you, you can't fake either or else you don't have them, okay? So honesty and integrity, I think, by the research that I did, have got to be uh, uh, cornerstones of this. Um, and then two other things that, that I'll throw out that I think have to be a part of this, of the what. One is responsiveness. It's not a perfect world. People make mistakes. Uh, you've got to be able to, you've got to be able to change your mind. You've got to be able to make a mistake and correct it. And at whatever scale you're operating on, macro or micro, 
this is part of something that everyone needs to learn because you will make mistakes. And it's funny, Jonathan, I mentioned it very briefly earlier, but the fourth thing I would throw out there would be open-mindedness. You have to hear, you have to know the other side. Part of, and I think a big part of finding balance, whatever that might be, and whatever this group might get to. But balance is understanding no matter where you're coming from, if you're a Bernie Madoff or you're a Greenpeace, you've got to hear and understand the other side of the issue. The who, well second the parents, and of course we all know it all starts with parenting if, if you're on an individual level, but who is in the best place to actually uh, get to individuals and, and, and well, it's, it's, it's educators, okay? So the, the front lines of this to me are the parents and even probably even more so the educators. And I'll tell you, and I'll, and I'll finish with one short story about what educators can do. And I apologize if anybody are smokers, but I don't know if what you know what our elementary schools are doing about smoking. <laughs> it's been very effective where we live. My three boys are Nazis about smoking, okay? I mean, they, they actually, when they were younger, they actually looked at it like there was actually something wrong with the person. As they get older and they realize that, gosh, nice people smoke too, so now they've got to evaluate this and kind of come to it. But with the health things they've been taught and everything, so I've got a, I've got a freshman here, I've got a ninth grader, I've got a seventh grader. All of them have gone through this little cycle, and it really didn't start at home for the most part, about smoking. And even my freshmen, they all are just like, they just can't understand why anybody would do it. And I see this as an example of a very simple issue of how educators can really make work and over generational time really make a difference. The last thing, and I'll go to the keynote thing, this is hard. I mean, ethics is hard, making the right decisions, and in the end, what we've got to do and what the goal has got to be you know, that I'll lay out there, we've got to teach people to make the right decision. Great, Ron, thank you for getting us off to this day. Thanks, thanks very much, Ron. Denise. Okay. Um, okay. Um, well, I, I kind of thought about, um, you know, what ethics really was in its essence. And to me, it really boils down to courage, uh, not to make, put too simplistic a face on it, but it, it's courage of self-awareness in my opinion. And the reason I say that is because if you look at, you know, all the most recent um, meltdowns that we've had from the savings and loan to Enron to the, the Wall Street debacle, there were two things that were evident in both of them. One, individuals don't usually act ethically one day and not ethically the next, or ethically in one situation and not ethically in another. It's movement along, along a continuum that goes to darker shades of gray. And that if you look at any of these blow-ups, even individual company meltdowns, that's usually what happens. And number two, there's an awful lot of groupthink going on. And all these situations, everybody seems to be involved. I mean, if you look at Enron, it was the management. It was the banks, it was the accountants, it was the insurance companies. They all had a hand in it. And so I think if you're in a position of responsibility and governance, you have to constantly have the courage to be self-aware of where you are at on that continuum from white to pale gray and, and make sure that you have a lot of self-awareness about how you are operating and then have the courage to retain your own ethics and principles. And that's very hard to do sometimes. Um, I also think that there is a bit of a distinction between ethics and responsibility, especially in the area of governance. And I'll use the example of, let's, let's look at some of the, the bonuses from, from the Wall Street um, debacle, the companies that had the TARP money um, set aside the amounts of the bonuses for a minute, and, and there were some bonuses, probably to mid-level people, that you know were contractual bonuses. These people did their job; they they you know created value for the company. They were entitled to the bonus, and assuming let's just assume that they were reasonable amounts of bonus. I mean, now that's not unethical to pay those bonuses, 
but in a, a situation where we were just came through, was it really responsible? Because to me, it was more, um, I guess, uh, you know, infuriating. Not the fact so much that they paid the bonuses, but that it seemed like Wall Street was completely out of touch with the reaction that Main Street would have. And, you know, to me, that was, you know, that just spells arrogance. When you're totally out of touch with what your, you know, uh, actions are going to have, um, the kind of reaction your actions are going to have on other people. And once you're in a situation of arrogance, then, I, you know, I think ethics go out the window. Um, so that's sort of my observation. And then the last point that I'll make is um, in terms of, I think the question was raised whether or not you can legislate eth ethics, and I don't think you can. And are we going to have reactionary legislation? Yes, we will. Will it work? Probably not. Um, I, you know, I had some experience with Sarbanes-Oxley. I happened to be on the board of the American Institute of CPAs at the time. So we were negotiating with the profession for the Sarbanes-Oxley um, legislation. And we s spent a lot of time, a lot of late nights, negotiating with Harvey Pitt, who was uh, chair of the SEC at the time. And it was all a negotiation. So that, I mean, and once you legislate anything, you know, you get the, the congressmen and the senators. It, it's all a legislation. So you're not going to end up with the optimal um, set of guidelines. Um, so is it going to, you know, completely deter this from happening again? No. Okay. Great. Thank you, Denise. <laughs> Thanks, Denise. Frank Sweeney. When we exchanged emails, Dr. Dobie and the great professor responded to some of my thoughts with more questions that made me do more thinking and realized <laughs> I'm back in school. Uh, but one of the questions he posed was, uh, think that in this time we're going to be getting a lot more uh, demand for responsibility. And will our responsibility come from the outside or will it come from the inside? And uh, I think it's probably both. I, like the other panelists, agree that there will clearly be regulations imposed from our government. Uh, will it solve the problems? No, it won't solve the problems, but, or all the problems. It'll solve some. Uh, why is that? Um, thinking back to the thing we're all born with, the seven deadly sins, pride, anger, lust, envy, gluttony, avarice, and sloth, they're not going away. <laughs> and so you can't legislate them away. So there is a need for personal integrity and personal ethics at the same time. From an institution standpoint or a company standpoint, what do you need to do? It's not rocket science. You establish policies, you communicate the policies, and you enforce the policies. And I'd say for the government, the same thing. The last is the most troublesome. How do you enforce them, and do you enforce them uniformly? And that's, uh, as Ron said, where the uh, devil's in the details and, and how things uh, get to be sticky. Ethics is the study of morals. Uh, ethics is the study of wisdom. Um, after the Drexel burn, oh no, after the Enron situation, the prosecutor was said to have heard to have said, where well, there's all smart people and no wise people, you have a formula for disaster. Mm -hmm. So you need some wisdom. Somebody has to stick up their finger, see which way the wind is blowing, and say this doesn't work. Kind of as Denise was saying, with the group think that goes on. Um, Joseph Campbell, uh, the uh, priest and Far East uh, theologian and philosopher, said, we're all born with the carpenters level in our system. We know when the bubble is on the beam, mm -hmm. and we know when it's not on the beam. And we can treat, uh, you know, lie to ourselves about whether it is or whether it isn't, but we know what it is. So how do you institutionalize that? Again, you're at the institution versus the personal level. Um, one quick thought is, I think back to the Wizard of Oz, and we're all leaders here, so everyone is the scarecrow. They have enough brains. And everybody has a heart. I think we're all from Villanova, and we've got the carry to us. And so what you need is the lion, courage, as Denise said. And with that, you can make the tough decision. And it's the enforcement. And it's the tough decision when it's going to cost you money mm -hmm. or your personal reputation is on the line that you need to uh, stand up. And uh, another idiom, the fish rots from the head down. So in organizations, it is paramount that the leader of the organization have and demonstrate the integrity and ethics that was said at lunch. And uh, I open up for that. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Frank. We did, uh, we did really great on time um, to get things going. So I want to just ask a, a one question to each of the panelists. Uh, Ron noted at the end of his remarks that uh, we educators are really on the front line in terms of trying to help especially young people that are still quite impressionable to develop some of the characteristics and the attributes that all of you mentioned and that were discussed 
in the previous panel and the luncheon speaker, and this may sound like an odd question, but we think we have ideas about tools and techniques and mechanisms to do that. I'm wondering what, what your opinion is of what we might do, either differently than what we're already doing or some new ideas or suggestions, because I think we all agree these attributes are important. We would all would like to um, possess them ourselves. We would like our children to possess them. But the, the challenge for us, and parents and educators, is how do we specifically translate that desire into uh, you know, improvement, behavioral improvement? So let me ask each of you just to say a word or two, and then we'll open it up to the rest of the uh, participants here. Ron. You know, I love that uh, analogy in the uh, keynote address about the futurist. Um, I, I heard something Goldman Sachs has, has put out that uh, in the next 20 year period, the emerging economies of the world, China, India, uh, Russia, Mexico, Brazil, et cetera, will have a GDP greater than the G7, 20 years. Now, that's a pretty stunning stat if you think about it. The G7, think about where we are and how the world works today, think about how it's been changing. That I mean, 20 years is a, as we all know, goes pretty doggone quick. That means the kids today are going to be in a completely different world, one we can, can barely imagine. So I would say this idea of looking forward and what, what is it going to be? What, what have you got to be in, you know, in like with interviews and stuff, and what are you going to be in five years, what are you going to be in ten years? Nobody likes those questions. But to really kind of take a decent snapshot of it and look out and what skills will you need in five or ten years to compete in this world, what might the world look like, I think is a is an exercise that, again, feeding off of the, the speech is as it is, I think this might, be the, this might be the big one. This is when it's really going to warp up and we're really going to start going fast. Thanks, Brian. Denise. I, just, I, I, mean, I think all the more reason why you have to reinforce the importance of ethical behavior. And I think especially for people starting out in their first position you know, where they, they don't have a lot of power, if they run across a situation that, that really is not comfortable for them, I, I, it will take a lot of courage for them to stick by their ethics. I would say teach them. You know, give them examples, put them in specific situations. Mm. That's where the rubber meets the road and that's what uh, people need. I think the, one of the best practical solutions now in solving ethical problems in the developing world is through uh, commerce. You know, mm -hmm. It's where money works. So the Electronics Industry Association, Intel, IBM, Cisco have mandated certain work rules be done for factories that supply them in China. So there are no overtime hours. There are things like that. It's costing companies a lot of money, but the companies with the big power are mandating the ethics. And if you want IBM's business, you better comply. Great. Good. Wonderful. Well, let's, uh, let's open things up now. Uh, if you have a question, please identify yourself and also if you are directing your question to one of the specific panelists. I'll probably speak loud enough. I'm Al Martinez Fonts, class of 71. Uh, glad to see Ron up there. Uh, Ron, you talked, I mean, really what this is all about is, you know, what can the university do? What should the university be doing? So, you know, you talked about the parenting part of it. You know, hopefully our parents all helped us out to get, you know, as far as we got, and then high school and then, you know, university and all that. But, you know, what specific steps can the university, and it's not really addressed at Ron only, but at every, at the whole panel, what should the university be doing to move this leadership type of position when it comes to ethics and responsibility? How do you teach it? You want me to take a shot? I think the first thing, and other people have mentioned this, you got to tell them it's hard. It's going to be hard, and, and there's no question that if, if those of you in the room that have been in those positions where you felt you were, you were swimming upstream with an ethical uh, idea or outcome and you feel like uh, everyone else thinks you're the one that doesn't get it, um, that's the feeling you've kind of got to try to teach because that's what it feels like to kind of be going lone wolf on an ethical issue in an organization, particularly if it comes, or any organization really, where the, the popular public opinion is going one way, and really there are, there are one or two or a few people that feel that really the direction should be the other way. Um, it, it's a lonely spot, and I, I think so, teaching them that it is hard and that it is lonely and it is hard to stick with is all part of letting them know that right is not easy. Uh, apparently we're recording.
recording this, so oh, one through uh, so no microphone's good. Um, hi, my name is Mara Sudis, and I'm a senior, so I am the person that you guys are talking about, the person that needs um, to be educated about ethics. And I guess the thing that would inspire me the most um, would be not to not to hear about the hardship that would be making an <coughs> ethical decision, but the feeling afterwards. The have, So have any of you had an experience after you've made the right decision and how that motivated you to make more right decisions? Yes, I had one where I had to uh, terminate the president of a subsidiary who was a friend because he clearly violated the company's ethics and received a lot of uh, pushback from the board and other people because it would adversely cost the company a great deal of money. But I also know the whole company knew the situation and was looking at it. And so it took a long time. We did a lot of the right things along the way to help that person individually, so you, you use your heart to do it. But at the end, it was a decision that needed to be made for the good of the organization. You feel good and you want to do it, and I think people respect it, although it's a long battle and lonely sometimes. I'll add to that is is that you can't be looking for instant gratification right. in the real rock that he was talking about that's the real rock that's part of the reality that you've got to know and accept and while it's and, and that's part of the the honesty of it it can be months years in fighting about a battle like that that you believe is an ethical one that you need to stand up for in an organization so it's not like today, tomorrow, and next week, you know, and people are clapping, you're walking out on stage. It doesn't work that way. I don't know if I'll run or Denise feel, but it seems to me that many times along that step, you question yourself. And you have yeah. to ask yourself, why am I taking the stand? Why and Go me? back and look at your own core beliefs right. as to what got you there, and are they still valid as you go down that process? There's no straight line. You know? But yes, there is great gratification at the end. Hi, I'm, I'm Bill Corboy from the class of 73. Coincidentally, or not coincidentally, Denise and Frank and I are off in the same class. Um, it, sounded, it sounded like to me that uh, neither of you two were very high on the option of regulatory involvement. Uh, but in light of what has happened and how an ethically driven atmosphere and culture really, really failed us, what are the options that we have, at least in the short term? I'm not completely opposed to regulatory involvement. I just don't think it, I don't think we should be lulled into the complacency of thinking that more regulation will prevent this from happening again. I definitely think that there can be, you know, more safeguards put in place, more deterrence, but I don't think we should view it as a panacea. Uh, I agree that, uh Laws and legislation are there for the minimal behavior, I believe, and you have the transgression, which will send you to jail or not. But it's not as the carrot and stick. But if you're aspiring to for leaders to be pulled further, you go for the higher um, goals. However, I think you're absolutely right. There is a role for government. It's supposed to uh, set up a system and it's supposed to enforce those systems so everyone else knows they can live by them. It's for society. Since we know it's going to happen, <laughs> we might as well get ready for it. Mr. Clario had a question from before, I believe. Yeah. Uh, Richard Clario, class of 54. Uh, we have the word transparency, and we're using the word honesty. Uh, I believe, and to educate maybe some wisdom that I may have to implore on you, is that I think the performance of the leader is very important. Because if the leader does not take his role as being just his and he allows to share it with the people that work for him or around him that to me brings forth an honest leader and something that I took after being in business for 50 years I would always tell my help or my associates that if you see me do something wrong you report to the next person in charge what Mr. Naclario did and then we'll discuss it because sometimes I think I have a lot of integrity and I wouldn't do anything, whether it was for money or anything else, throughout my life. And uh, it helped me guide me and the people that worked with me to say, hey, this is a good place to work. Mr. Naclario is report. He wants to be held accountable. As a leader, 
I feel that's very important. And sometimes we get ego comes into the picture, and that's sometimes when we may lose it. I'm not talking on this big governmental scale. I'm just a small guy, has 200 people work for me, still at 78. And I, it, it's very important. I instill, instill those rules. It's a different business, but I think those, if you treat you with yourself, within yourself, you start out honest. I don't think, unless you're doing something that you want, something greater, you don't have to give up your morals or your integrity or anything else because usually it's only for money. That's what I like to say. Hi, I'm Tom Klein, and I was in the class of 84. Um, you know, companies don't always feel comfortable going out there and, and explicitly putting a lot of focus on things like we, are, we have good governance, we have great ethics. But, you know, as leaders, I think a lot of us are grappling with, um, you know, half of this country and in many, in much of the world right now doesn't have a great impression of leaders, particularly CEOs. I and mean, if you look at how CEOs are perceived, it's actually scary. So we all know great ethical good guys and, and women who are leading companies, but they're not perceived as being great and ethical and good. Um, so as we grapple with this issue of how do, we, how do we get people behind us again and how do we get people to follow when there's such a bad impression, how can we use, how do you think we can more visibly use we are ethical, we do have good governance, we are responsible more visibly, um, either in our own organizations or, or really more broadly as we're out talking about running places. Uh, I think that we're in a show me time. Yeah. I don't think we're getting that till we show it. <laughs> so talking about it, and, and when I was researching this, and uh, the number of corporations that do do a lot of this, that do do the PR side, and I think the world uh, and everyone, I think everybody's getting just a little bit jaded with that. It's pretty easy. This is a media hyped world, and, and people know they realize what they hear is not exactly what the real situation is. At least they're skeptical. So I think for a five-year period, I, I, and I hope we're in, I think the, the people that take that baton, and that is, is that it's show me. The best way out of this now is to just, you know, hunker up the oxes and start plowing and, and show people what business can do when it is right directed. Excuse me. I, I, I'm not a business person. I'm a psychologist. And uh, so... I'm sort of, and I'm a consumer, and uh, I, I represent, I guess, the uh, the, con the consumer group, the constituents that sort that serves the group of, that, uh, excuse me, that make composes the group of uh, called shareholders. Uh, I, I I have lost confidence. I lost just enough money in the, <laughs> the 401k debacle to really make me crazy and rabid, and and cause me to wonder uh, why uh, business has not moved to. Uh, to approximate or follow what the, the legal industry has done. I sat on the Board of Governors of the D.C. Bar for 12 years. They self-govern themselves. They have set up a Board of Professional Responsibility, and they, uh, they have operationally defined the word ethics to be more to various transgressions that do not necessarily uh, uh, rise to the level of commi committing a crime, you know. Uh, but they do uh, provide for some type of redress and or some type of relief for people who have been aggrieved by people who have done something unethically. I was shocked, you know, when, at Enron, when all those nice people lost their money, you know, through unethical conduct, and nobody, there was no instrument or vehicle in place for them to get their money back. All of their children, all of the wise men sat on their hands, and, and, and they still haven't been compensated. I mean, the, 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 uh, what do you call it, the credit default swap. The debacle, you know what I mean? The derivatives debacle, you know, the 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 trading of of uh, of, uh, of stocks and bonds with with hidden transaction fees. You know, I I, I work for the federal government, and uh, we have this large fund of money uh, uh, that we, that is our that that is invested uh, for us. Um, and I was shocked to find out that Barclays of London. Was the was the fiduciary handling the investments for uh, most of the federal government uh, retirement funds pre-retirees? Now I'm not sure how that happened, but well, I do know that Barclays was put in receivership, you know, along with Lloyd's, et cetera, you know. And so I'm wondering, you know, exactly who who is watching the door 
And will business rise to the level? And will Villanova teach courses on ethics with, that operationally defines and advocates for the institutionalization of boards of professional responsibility that, uh, that have teeth and, and uh, that can bring about some type of redress and relief for, for us little people? Maybe I could just uh, speak on behalf of Villanova for just a moment. Um, I, I think we take very seriously the, the concerns that, that, you, that you raise. And indeed, there have been calls in the business school world for some kind of professional code that is analogous to the, the Hippocratic Oath, the, the codes that lo the lawyers develop in other professions. And um, so I, I, there's a lot of discussions of, around that, number one. Number two, in terms of our own classroom teaching, you know, we're very committed to um, bringing these issues, issues to the fore, and as was suggested here, using role play simulations and other in a real world uh, uh, circumstances to help our students understand the consequences of their action. But I wonder if Frank might respond to the question as well. Frank has a legal background in addition to a business background, and I wonder if you have ever thought about, Frank, the potential of taking some of the uh, codes and, and self-governing practices from the legal world and whether that would work in the business world. I think it would be a great idea. Look at uh, Bernard of Clairvaux said in 1100 that the reason lawyers have a monopoly and are allowed to practice law is they have an ethical obligation to do it correctly. And it's a profession that no one else is allowed in until they meet the state requirements. That's carried through so the ethics continues. Uh, it would be a great idea to carry over to business. Um, the legal ethics is a whole different animal. I once gave a speech on the difference between legal ethics and philosophical ethics. Uh, but that's a system that the lawyers adopted that said if you have conflicting ideas, truth will emerge from that. So uh, the only one that has an obligation to speak the truth is the DA. Lawyers on both sides don't have the obligation to speak the truth, but to seek the truth. And it came out, what shocked me was I went to an employment law, and the, the premise was uh, I represent uh, people in an employment law situation. Everyone knows employment lawyers lie. If I don't lie, I'm not being ethical to my client because I haven't advocated for him to the best extent he's entitled to. And that was the ultimate result, actually. It threw me crazy because that's the uh, legal system. For uh, business purposes, I think it would be a great idea to do it. But honestly, I think there's a lot of laws out there that are not being enforced. And it takes the courage and the enforcement to do the securities litigation, to have the securities uh, companies and boards come down and affect that, to have uh, people talk about violations of ethics and terminate people that don't do it. Whether you can get the money back to the individual who's hurt, I've been hurt, you've been hurt, uh, I'm not sure that's there, but there, uh, one sense is there's not a commitment on behalf of society to enforce things that are already existing. Denise, I'm sorry, you had a comment as well. I do have a comment. I, 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 you know, I, I also think it's not only just the, you know, maybe the, um, code of ethics or whatever in the business world analogous to attorneys or CPAs have a, a code of ethics as well. Um, but I also think that there could be a lot of improvement to board culture. A lot of boards are insular. There's a lot of boards that are filled with a lot of CEO types from similar sized organizations that all approach things with this similar backgrounds and mindset. And, and I, you know, I go back to what you were saying. I mean, if you get someone on a board who owns their own business, who has their own money on the line, who has to deal with their employees much more directly sometimes, I think you get a different mindset. And you just, it, it just adds more to the mix, I think, because it, you definitely can change you know, the way a board operates based on you know, infusing some diversity. And when I say diversity, I mean all, all kinds of diversity. I think it's important. I think we might have time for one or two more questions. Al Clay, class of 79. Um, I guess it, I, I, it's not really a question, but a comment. I spent an awful lot of time on this, uh, on this subject, and, and I, don't, I don't mean to criticize the, uh, the topic, but I think part of the issue that we face is, is in the wording of this topic, where it's asking for balance between uh, governance and, and ethics. And it reminds me of a time about 10 years ago or so when someone pointed at me and screamed that I was too Catholic to be successful. And uh, I took as my mantra from that day forward, uh, particularly to prove that there was no such thing. And, and I think what we need to do is, I hate to use this 
management <laughs> paradigm. We we need to think a little bit more about this is this is not in conflict. Ethical management is good management, is responsibility. It's it's not so much of a balance, but but to raise the level of our thinking uh, to the point where we see it, it, it is all. It's not in conflict. It's in uh, confluence. Jack Quinlan, uh, class of 54, along with Richard. <laughs> Where are you, Rich? Uh, I like to just build on what Al said. Uh, it, I came from a DuPont culture, and I always said to people there were only two ways to get fired at DuPont. One was to be unsafe, uh, safety was first, and equally important, ethics. If you were unethical in DuPont, you were gone. Um, it didn't matter what, what job you had. It's an, it, to me, it's an environment that you have to teach. You, you have, as leaders, looking at it from the leader's viewpoint, we have to create and maintain an environment that values ethics. And you can't do that hit or miss. And we heard that at lunch today. And, and I just offer the thought that it's, it's a culture, it's an environment, you're either in an ethical environment, you can't turn it on, you can't turn it off. It's either you have it or you don't have it. And I, I just leave it with one other thought that my father told me 50 years ago when I got my first promotion at DuPont from lowest level clerk to the next lowest level clerk. <laughs> and he said, don't ever forget, the further up the pole the monkey goes, the more his ass shows. <laughs> <laughs> that is a very real statement, believe me. <laughs> and I've, I've used that with my, my boys who are in various management positions, and I used it with the chairman of DuPont, who was a friend of mine when he, made, when he was made chairman. I told him that. And he looked at me strangely, and I said, Ed, don't forget it, you know? <laughs> and, and he told me later, you know, it's the best advice I ever had. And I think we need to remind people of that, because you're seeing it all, you see it today, and all the business culture things you're reading about, everything else, the further up the pole the monkey goes, the more his ass shows. Well, well, thank you very much. We had some great comments from the panel here, and great questions and comments. Um, let me just say that uh, in the business school and Villanova University more broadly, we, we think we do a very good job in terms of our efforts to infuse our curriculum with, with ethics and, and responsibility, both theoretically, conceptually, and practically, especially here in the business school. That practical application is important. But nonetheless, we could always do better. And so we welcome your involvement, especially those of you that have faced the tough decisions and that you're able to share some of the experiences you've had in an in a, in a, in affirmative way that can help some of our young people. Um, develop some of the attributes that we've been talking about uh, this morning and this afternoon. So Bob would like to uh, offer a couple closing uh, comments here. Well, thank you. On behalf of the, uh, the Alumni Association, uh, I want to thank all of you for uh, not only participating today, uh, but also bringing a, a topic that, uh, you know, clearly in, in all of our industries, when we talk about Wall Street to Main Street, uh, is something that uh, uh, is not taken for granted because we're all in this room. Uh, ethics does exist. Uh, violation of ethics in this room are noticed uh, and discussed, and, uh, and, and that in and of itself is, uh, is a very strong comment. I want to thank the, uh, the panelists. We have a gift for, for, for all of you. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Doe, by the way, the perfect name for Wall Street. Um, <laughs> And uh, for those of you that are, are going to be in this room, uh, you're already here. For those of you that are going to your next uh, location, uh, good luck. You're late. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.